Hey everybody, welcome to the Fire It Up with CJ show. Today we have Dr. Stephen Curley and he is talking about his book, In My Hands, uh, about uh, his experience um, as a surgeon and working with cancer patients and his stories, hopeful and um, courageous stories of his patients throughout time. So welcome, Dr. Curley. Thank you, CJ. Pleasure to be here. So I want to find out a little bit more about um, your specialty, and, and I know that you're a cancer surgeon, but tell me a little bit about your specialty and the type of patients you normally work with. I am uh, what's called a gastrointestinal surgical oncologist, meaning I take care of patients who have cancer of the stomach, the liver, the pancreas, the colon, the GI system. Okay, got it. And and tell me something, tell me a little bit about what is unique about, I don't, I have an uncle who died of a, of a liver cancer and it was kind of, uh, it was to the stage where he couldn't even be operated on. It was that bad. And so I assume that there's some unique aspects of cancers in the regions that you operate in. Well, what we know about all of these cancers is from a surgical point of view, patients do best if we find them earlier. Mm. So you mentioned your uncle, the fact that his was diagnosed already at an advanced stage is unfortunate. And in those situations, oftentimes surgery is no longer an option. Mm. Uh, if these cancers have spread to other organs, uh, they, then we have to rely on our colleagues in medical oncology, sometimes radiation oncology to help us out. Uh, but mm. we're less likely to cure the patients. Mm. So these are all cancers that if we find them in an early stage, we have the potential to provide curative surgical treatment for the patients by removing the, the organ where the cancer began. Mm. Now you talk about one of your chapters, um, a, a research that you did in Italy, where you actually found that discovering some. What were the? What are some preventative things that we can do, given the nature of the kind of cancer you're talking about? That it's like if you catch it too late, it's impossible. But if you catch it earlier on, what are some things? If we have that kind of cancer in our family, we can do. Is it, is it first of all, is it genetic? So the fact that my uncle had it, um, I had a cousin who died at age 40 from colon cancer. Um, how genetic are those kinds of cancers? And if so, what are some preventative things you can do? Well, so liver cancer usually is not genetic okay. uh, to address the one you mentioned with your uncle. It tends to be more related to environmental factors, mm. uh, specifically infection with hepatitis B or C virus oh. are the two most common causes around oh. the world. Okay. And so people who have those chronic viral infections are mm. at a higher risk. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the study that I performed in Italy that was on patients who had chronic hepatitis C virus. We evaluated close to 11,000 patients and we followed. And we found that we could diagnose more patients with early stage tumors that we could treat with surgery. Mm. So that was the whole purpose of that trial was to try and find more patients with earlier stage disease. Mm. Uh, for colon cancer, somewhere between 15 and 20 percent are genetic. And certainly when we find patients, you mentioned, you know, somebody diagnosed at age 40. Yeah, that would cousin. set off an immediate set of alarm bells for us. And we would then begin testing other family members because that is a very early age to be diagnosed with colon cancer. So we would test siblings, parents, children, uh, because there may be a, gene a genetic mutation in that individual or that individual's family members that puts them at higher risk to develop colorectal cancer. Mm, okay, so that's different than a cousin. He was my cousin. So is it generally directly in the, uh, you'd said like brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers? Well, uh, again, cousin, it, it would mean testing. I don't know if this was your aunt or uncle, but, you know, obviously your parents would then be tested. Um, and again, if certain mutations were found, then that would flow down to you you, any of your siblings, any children you have, that type of thing. Right. Yeah. It was my, my father's brother's son. So it's not necessarily a direct connection, but indirect still would be something. So indirect. And, right. And we would, in that situation, say certainly his father would need to be tested, his mother, 
if he and his father had certain genetic mutations that would lead to testing of your father because obviously he is a sibling of uh, your mm-hmm. uncle and uh, then again downstream testing to you and any of your siblings uh, okay so these are the preventative things so i get i get a colonoscopy every 5 years because i've uh, actually after he got diagnosed i started getting a colonoscopy right away and then every 5 years i get a colonoscopy um you talked about um, the hepatitis B and C. I assume if you actually have hepatitis B or C, you would know it at this juncture in your life. Do you know that you have a virus? Uh, if you ha- I don't have it, so I don't really know. It's amazing the number of people who don't know that they have either hepatitis B or C. Uh, and so many people, unfortunately, may have been exposed and not realized it. Oh. Uh, many people are not diagnosed until they already have liver damage, uh, mm. meaning cirrhosis of the liver from damage caused by the chronic infection. Mm. Mm-hmm. Hepatitis B virus, unfortunately, can be passed from mother to child. Oh, wow. Hepatitis C is not passed that way. Uh, hepatitis C usually you get from a blood transfusion or from an infected needle, those sorts of things. I see. Uh, but sadly, there are still many patients who are diagnosed with those infections who are surprised when they come to learn they have liver damage. Oh, so is that something that I should, when I go for my annual physical check to see if I have hepatitis B or C? It's always a good idea to get checked. Yes. Wow. Okay. All it takes is a simple blood test and... If you're negative, then you're negative and you know it. Right. And if you're positive, then you also know it and probably want to check for cancer in that area. Wow. Well, you do. And you also want to be treated. You know, there are now effective treatments for hepatitis B and C uh, that can eradicate the virus and can reduce your risk of developing problems. Mm. So in the best case, like your um, your research study in, in, in Italy, you find these things beforehand. How often, when, when you actually see patients, how often are they in, you know, more um, dire state? Well, unfortunately, far too many. Um, you know, again, particularly with cancers like pancreas and liver cancer, uh, many patients who are referred to me, uh, I have to have very difficult conversations with them and tell them, look, you know, based on the images we've done, whether it be CT scans, MRI scans, whatever, you know, your tumor is uh, too widespread, it's too advanced, or in the case of liver cancer, many of these patients also have cirrhosis of the liver caused by hepatitis B or C virus or what's, alcohol it's, abuse, And what's perhaps. cirrhosis, just for people like myself who may not know what cirrhosis is? So cirrhosis, sorry, I'll try to minimize the medical lingo. Uh, <laughs> cirrhosis is literally scarring of your liver. Oh, wow. Uh, And so it is a condition that occurs from anything that causes chronic inflammation and damage to your liver. And so many people, when they hear the word cirrhosis, they think of alcoholics. Certainly alcoholism and alcohol abuse is a common cause of cirrhosis. But worldwide, hepatitis B or C virus infection is the most common cause of chronic damage to the liver and anything that causes inflammation in your liver ultimately can lead to cirrhosis, uh, which is just chronic scarring of the liver, and it can cause liver failure, other liver problems. Ah, uh, okay. So by the time you have some of your patients, not only he- from having hepatitis and and some of these other uh, cancer, they have both the damage of the liver and then also a cancer. They're two twofold. Is that what your your point you were trying to make? That's exactly right. Okay. That's exactly right. The liver is a unique organ in the human body. Mm -hmm. Uh, I do a lot of liver surgery. Uh, Mm -hmm. The liver is the only organ in the human body that if you take part of it out, it will grow back. It will regenerate. Wow. In people who have cirrhosis of the liver, damage to the liver, their liver may not regenerate. And so Mm -hmm. we cannot perform surgery on them oftentimes they may have a solitary tumor in their liver but it's in a location where i would have to take out so much liver i know that they would go into liver Mm. failure after i did the operation Mm. because their liver does not regenerate normally Mm. i can't imagine being in your position where you're often telling people it's too late i mean how 
what is that like for your own experience when you're telling someone like, well, you know, it, you're kind of like working on small probabilities at this point. What is it like for you? Well, it's, it's an emotionally charged field. There's no doubt about it. Taking care of cancer patients is not easy. Um, and I've been taught some very fortunate lessons by some of my patients, thankfully, mm -hmm. which is that hope doesn't always mean that we're offering patient cure. It's that we're offering them the hope to walk the journey with them, mm. to stay by their side, to offer assistance where we can, to help provide care for symptoms they may develop. And it's interesting, you know, I think it's too often forgotten, cancer is a diagnosis that affects the entire family and community around an individual. Mm -hmm. uh, so whether it be a spouse, brothers, sisters, children, whatever, uh, co-workers, uh, you know, it has a profound impact on everybody around the individual patient. Mm -hmm. So we also, I think, must be mindful to provide care for them and to make sure that they're getting the support they need in whatever way we can provide mm. that. Is it just, is it the, the care that's needed is not only the shock and of, of having someone that you, the possible loss of someone, but then also um, just the amount of time and, and support that you need physically to take care of someone or what is the, I, I, fortunately so far I haven't encountered anyone in my direct family who's had cancer. I don't, so I don't really have a good sense. What, how would you describe the nature of, of what happens when you have a family member diagnosed with cancer? Well, it immediately introduces fear and anxiety. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, depending on the type of cancer and the stage of cancer, you know, you're suddenly hit by the thought, gee, am I, am I facing near term my own mortality? Oh. And if it's a loved one, a family member, you know, you, same thing, you know, it, it, what is this going to mean for our family? How is this going to impact us if our family member ultimately dies from their cancer? Uh, you know, it may be the person who provides support and income for the family or care for the family. You know, these all of these flood of emotions come rushing forth unexpectedly mm -hmm. uh, to everybody around the patient. Mm. Uh, and it's really that angst and anxiety that is very difficult for people to deal with. Right. So it's the fear of the unknown and the anxiety of if, if I'm, I'm going to be secure and safe and not knowing Correct. those things. Wow, okay. And so Correct. how has your your relationship to those things yourself changed over time? Because we're constantly in a state of unknown um, and you're, we are constantly in a place of maybe not even feeling secure. I mean, this is kind of the n nature of the human existence, but way worse, you know, in an exponential sense. How has it changed the way you live your life? Well, it, it, you know, it's not me to enjoy every day. Um, you know, none of us knows how much time we're granted on this earth. Um, I've had amazing things happen to people that I thought were fully healthy. And then, you know, they're here one day and then gone the next. And it's mm. a stunning thing when it happens. Um, and so, you know, it's taught me to enjoy my, my life, my family, uh, to be thankful for the fact that I get to help people every day in my career uh, and to really be focused on trying to be helpful and compassionate and empathetic when I can. Mm. So one of the things that you mentioned in your book is about the relationship of family and work and, and hearing people's regrets, you know, when they're facing um, their mortality. Um, what have you, how has that changed kind of how you think about family and relationships? Well, it taught me early in my life, um, you know, I have a son and a daughter who are now grown and successfully on with their own lives and careers. And, you know, working as a physician, it's oftentimes very easy to be consumed by one's work and to work long hours and not be present uh, physically, emotionally, miss events. And, you know, it, it taught me I, I did not ever want to look back I say, gosh, I wish I'd have spent more time with my kids when they were young because mm. you can never recapture that. Mm. And so 
I changed my lifestyle. I would come into work sometimes very, very early in the morning, 4.30 or 5 in the morning, and get my work done so that I could be out by 5 or 6 in the afternoon. And, you know, I coached their soccer teams and I coached their basketball teams and I went to school events and plays, you name it, and just made sure that I I had the time to do those things so that I had that critical relationship with them um, and I've certainly heard colleagues who've, who've said that, you know, it's not just patients. I've heard colleagues say, gosh, I didn't spend enough time with my kids when mm. they were young. And it's like, gosh, what, a, what a horrible thing to look back on your life and say, I, I don't want to be that person. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, so those are the kinds of ways that your, your work experience has changed your life experience. Are there Absolutely. Any, yeah. And what are the other ways that you, your life or your worldview has changed as a result of your, your work? Well, I've learned the importance of taking time to take care of yourself. So for me, you know, burning off some of the negative energy that can come from just these difficult experiences, you know, sometimes having to mm. give bad news to patients or their families, uh, you know, there, there is a burden that, that is, is built up over time. Mm. And for me, exercise is important. So walking with my family or going to the gym and working out, uh, I've done that for years. I've had mm. friends that I work out with. And those sorts of things really help me both physically and mentally um, stay more balanced. Yeah. And one of the things, one of the chapters, you talk about how caretakers take on a, a huge share. And so is that what you're talking about, the, the energy that you actually are having to work out? Oh, yeah. And that's why, you know, I, I also worry about the family members. You know, as I said, if a patient is referred to me, obviously they are my focus. But I will frequently, after talking to the patient and explaining things to them, will turn to the family members and say, I'm going to warn you. I'm going to occasionally nag you a little bit. Mm. You know, I, I tell my patients, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to be on you to, to walk, even if you're feeling tired, and to eat a healthy diet. But I'll tell the family members the same thing because I've seen family members be so consumed by the care of their loved one that their health suffers. Mm. And they then get to a point where they develop illnesses or, Mm. you know, they're not taking their medication. They're not taking good care of themselves. They're not sleeping well enough. They can get depressed. All of these are things that I have seen and that I'm wary of. You know, and again, that I worry about not only in my patients, but my patients' family members. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I totally get that. Now, how, um, uh, <laughs> I just lost, I want to talk about, I want to loop back to um, the thing that you said earlier, which is sometimes you have a patient who looks great one day and like bad news the next. Um, can you tell me about that and then contrast it with, in chapter one, you talk about a patient who seemed kind of didn't look, prognosis was not so great. Um, can you tell us about the kind of, the almost the two spectrums of what you've seen? Yeah, so you know, patients oftentimes, again, when they're diagnosed with cancer, it's a cold, hard slap in the face. You know, it's, mm-hmm. wow, you know, am I going to survive this? And the treatments that we use can be daunting. Uh, You know, it it may require major surgical procedures and the pain and recovery that goes along with that. Chemotherapy has side effects. Radiation therapy has side effects. You know, there can be a profound and in some cases permanent effect on a patient's life because Mm. of the treatments we use, even when we're successful. Mm. So that's something that I think we need to be mindful of and, and to recall and and to be very honest with our discussions with patients about the potential things that could happen, even if they have a successful outcome. Mm-hmm. You know, you mentioned chapter one in my book. It was a, it is a story about a man who was a, a minister who had colon cancer that had spread to his liver. He was told by his medical oncologist, you know, look, you probably only got about six months to live. You should go and enjoy the rest of your time. And he literally told this man his hobby was fishing. He said, you should go do some fishing. Well, this man came and saw me and was very down, very depressed. And, um, you know, I said, look, you know, 
preacher, I, I think it's going to be difficult, but I think I can do an operation to remove these tumors, but it's going to push you. Mm-hmm. And he said, look, I'm willing to take that chance. Well, that man went on to live more than 11 years. Mm-hmm. And it just goes to show you that with any given patient, we always have to do our best. And even if it means pushing the envelope a bit, try to do what we can to improve their chances at longer term survival. Mm-hmm. And the sort of the funny twist in that story is he, he was a very tall, big, imposing man with a deep bass voice. And he would kind of look down on me and go, Doctor, you are not God, sir. And I said, <laughs> you're right. I am not. Don't think I am. And he said, well, apparently my other doctor thinks he is because he told me I was going to be dead in six months. Wow. And he got after the six month mark passed. We had a tradition. Every time he came to see me, I would call his medical oncologist and first apologize, but then hand my patient the phone and he'd get on the on the uh, on the phone with the doctor. Said, "Hello, doctor, it's me. Would you like to go fishing?" <laughs> and uh, this medical oncologist told me, you know, I, I learned my lesson. He said, uh, "You know, I, I tell patients, look, we can quote you statistics and averages all day long, but." We never know how long a given patient will live. Mm. And all we can do with each patient is try our best. Uh, some patients live less long than we think. Some live longer than we think they will. You know, we can, we can project and we have probabilities, but we have no certainty with any given patient. Mm. So that was how he changed so that there wasn't somehow when he said six months, it kind of, it made that um, patient completely like, okay, like you, you're like God dooming me to death in six months. And so now, now he offers kind of a, who knows, but then it seems like right. a, a challenging thing because it could have also been like, you know, six days, you know, so the guy was not prepared. How do you, how do you balance those two things? Uh, well, you, you just have to be very straightforward with people. Um, you know, some of our treatments are, are risky. You know, patients can die from complications after a surgical procedure. Uh, patients can have a bad reaction to medication. I've seen people whose lifespan was actually shortened by the treatments that were mm. used for their cancer. Mm-hmm. And so that's a mm. harsh reality that mm-hmm. we mm-hmm. have to discuss with patients you know, we may do things that actually hasten your demise right. in our attempts to treat your cancer. So that's a tough conversation to have with somebody, particularly when one of those things happens. You know, if somebody, you know, for example, chemotherapy drugs can suppress the body's immune system. I've had patients who have died from infections because their body's immune system was so suppressed by our treatments. Wow. Uh, and that a horrific thing to happen and uh, you know then have to deal with with the patient and their family right so you know all of these things are are very real reminders that while we're doing our best with every patient there is a potential cost and there are certainly risks associated with our treatments Mm. so you have a um, chapter in your book called go for it and where you talk about kind of balancing the benefit and the the risk and um, you're saying that you're so, somewhat surprised how often people don't, they just, just go for it, you know, and you try to tell them all the trade-offs. Tell me a little bit about if, if you were to have a comp, if you were to, I'm actually, maybe this isn't a good example, but if someone that you love said, okay, I'm going in, you know, and I don't want you to treat me because it's, you know, for whatever reason, and they're going to a doctor, Uh, Your son, no, I don't want to even say that. Someone you know and love, someone I know, and I don't know who to say because someone that someone you're that they're going to the doctor and they actually want to ask the requisite questions to make an informed, intelligent decision. What are the questions that they should be asking to make the appropriate trade offs? Whether you know, is this going to shorten my life? Is my quality of life going to be worse? I mean, what are the questions you would be asking? Well, you know, I, I would ask them, you know, what are the optimal treatment options? What is the data supporting using that option, whether it be, and, and oftentimes, you know, in modern cancer treatment, we practice what is called multidisciplinary care. Mm-hmm. The honest answer is no one treatment is best. Mm. 
-hmm. It's usually a combination of treatments. Mm -hmm. So that may mean chemotherapy, radiation therapy, immunotherapy, surgery. And frequently, it's not just combining all those. It's the timing of those. Oftentimes, Mm. with certain cancers, we may do chemotherapy or chemotherapy and radiation therapy before surgery. Because we have data that shows that patients who get those treatments first actually have a better chance at survival after surgery. So as a surgical oncologist, part of my job is to know at what point an operation is appropriate in a patient's care. Mm. And so it's important that the patient and their family sort of ask the physician, who else is going to be on the team who's going to be treating me? Mm -hmm. It's not just me as a surgeon. You know, there may be medical oncologists, radiation Mm. oncologists, Mm -hmm. nutritionists, Mm -hmm. uh, other people to support that patient to try and do everything we can to minimize the impact of our treatments and improve their chance at long-term success. Mm. Okay, so here's the questions I heard. One is, what is the optimal treatment plan? And specifically, what I'm looking from, from my doctor is, what are the combinations of That plan would include the combinations of treatments as well as the timing. And then what are the specific, what specific data do you have to prove to me that this is the right plan? And then who on the team should I be, who else on the team should I be meeting with? Or what is the question that I'd be asking as a patient? Okay. Right. You know, so again, if a patient is sitting in front of me and I'm talking about surgical procedures, you know, I also have to be telling them, well, you know, I think you're going to need an operation, but you may not need your operation as your first treatment for your cancer. You may need chemotherapy or radiation first. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to have you see a medical oncologist and a radiation oncologist. And by the way, I want to make sure that you maintain a healthy lifestyle and eat a good diet. So I'm going to have you see a nutritionist Mm. uh, and talk about, you know, what are the things, because people oftentimes, you know, feel wow, I'm turning my life over to all these doctors to treat me for this cancer. And it's a little bit of a a helpless feeling. And people want to maintain some control of their own outcome. And how can I do that? And I tell people, you can have some say in how you do. If you maintain a healthy lifestyle, if you walk for 30 to 45 minutes a day, if you eat a healthy diet, make sure you don't lose weight. Those are all things that, that we actually have scientific evidence that shows people who do those things actually do better with the treatments. They have fewer side effects. They recover from the operations faster. Mm. So those are things people can do to help themselves along the path. I see. So there, so it's not necessarily, it may, I may skip through having to have surgery, but I can actually be better prepared and healthy so that I actually have a better outcome and result after surgery. Exactly right. Okay, got it. So that's why, and I, I assume when you have yeah, people say, just go for it, is that because they're like, get it out, get it out of me, like it's some, you know, demonic entity that needs to be removed. Is that what is compelling yeah, them to like say? like an alien. Yeah, like get it out, get alien. it out. Yeah, so is that is that right. what's causing them to want to jump ahead to surgery before some of these other things? Yeah, oftentimes it is. You know, people... You know, they they may know they're informed enough to understand that surgical removal of their tumor gives them the best chance of getting rid of it. Mm. And so they want to they want it out. They want it out as soon as possible. Right. And so that chapter, go for it, is sort of about my using it, my amazement that a major, massive life decision, like having a, a huge cancer operation you know, people are ready to sign on the dotted line after just a few minutes of conversation. Mm. And it's like, no, wait a minute, we, we need to discuss this a little more fully. We need to consider the implications on your life, you know, what this means for you in terms of the impact, the recovery, how it's going to affect you after the operation. Mm. So, um, you know, those mm. are all things that amaze me that, you know, people will take hours, days, and week before they make a decision on buying a new car, but they're ready to let me do a massive surgical procedure after just two or three minutes of conversation sometimes. I'm, I'm always amazed by that. And that's a very high level of trust that they're putting in their physician. And I think that it's important that I and 
my colleagues being respectful to that and say, mm-hmm. you know, this person is really putting a lot of trust in me and I have to honor and respect that trust. Right. And what are the life, um, you mentioned um, implications on life. So once you actually go and, you know, get the chemotherapy, go through and get the, you know, get the, what are the implications on your life or lifestyle for yourself and loved ones once you're on that path? Well, it's variable for every patient, and it depends on the specific operation you're talking about. Yeah. So there's no one simple answer for that. It depends on what the operation is. Every set of chemotherapy drugs has particular side effects. So, Mm -hmm. you know, when we discuss chemotherapy with patients, we tell them these are the possible side effects you can have. This is what the impact might be on your life. You know, there are some drugs that, for example, that can cause uh, loss of sensation, uh, loss Mm. of nerve function. Mm. Um, You know, I have a patient who is a long-term survivor from stage four colon cancer, but who unfortunately had very bad side effects, had loss of sensation in his fingers from the chemotherapy treatments he received. And this was life-altering for him because... He was a first chair violist for a major symphony orchestra, Mm -hmm. and he was no longer able to play the viola. Mm -hmm. So, yes, he survived his cancer, but at a huge impact to his life. Yeah. So, I mean, the meaning and probably probably what gave him meaning in his life, which gave him livelihood, was no longer. I mean, so that's like a huge transition. It's not only the health transition, but also the work transition that he had to go through after receiving the surgery. So probably not recognizing like, wait a second, that means I can't play music, which is something I love doing. Um, that's a hard, tra- it's a hard trade off. Um, you had mentioned earlier that sometimes you have to look at, you said that, uh, some people's lives are shortened by the treatment. Tell me what that may look like or what you were referring to. Well, um, you know, again, they may have a complication from chemotherapy. They may get an infection. Uh, you know, sometimes we do these major surgical procedures and patients have a complication after surgery or get an infection after surgery. Uh, you know, I, anybody who's a surgical oncologist, unfortunately, can tell you stories of patients who uh, developed a major complication after an operation that we did. Uh, whether that be an infection or a, a blood clot that went to their lungs mm. or uh, perhaps the stress of the operation caused a heart attack. Mm-hmm. You know, I've had that happen to a patient. Wow. Uh, you know, the operation went perfectly, but then they, they suffered a major heart attack afterwards. You know, these are uh, big, stressful events in somebody's life. Mm-hmm. And so that's beyond distressing for me as a treating physician to have something like that mm. happen. But it's also obviously, you know, horrible for the patient's family to, you know, then to be dealing with that, you know, something totally unexpected, even though we have discussions with the patients and their families that these things could happen mm-hmm. and we have them sign consent forms, recognizing that yes, something bad could happen when it actually happens. It's, it's terrible. Mm. And so I have a, uh, my teacher, my writing teacher is, uh, had cancer. She decided, and she was on some special treatments some uh, experimental things. One of the things she's doing now is bone marrow transplant. And she said that this is, this knocked her out. She was basically in the hospital for the vast majority of every day for a, a period of, I don't know how many months. I, it feels like a, over six months. She's, and she said, I don't know if I would do it again. Because my life was, I mean, my life was, and she's had really good results, but she's like, I don't really know if going to the hospital every single day and feeling as awful as I did and not knowing that my probabilities would increase that much, I don't know if I would do it again. (laughs) And I thought, well, that must be a really hard thing to decide. And, And at the time when she had the bone marrow transplant, it was something along the lines of like, well, 50% of the people, I can't remember, something like 50% of the people who do have this have, like, really good outcomes and live, you know, X number of years, and 50% don't. So it's not necessarily like a 90-10. It was like a 50-50 odds, but it was a 
you know, if you do the expected value, it was like 50% of 11 or 50% of zero. And you go, okay, well, at least, you know, six and a half on average that I may be able to live. So most rational people would elect to do it. But she said after doing, she's like, I don't know. It took so much out of me. I'm not the same person as I used to be. So I guess I'm, I'm just wondering how age plays into this as well. She's in, um, I think probably her late sixties, but if my not, my, my 90 year old grandmother, I think probably died of cancer and she just elected not to do anything. She didn't even go to the doctor because I think she thought, why? So how does age factor right. into some of these diagnoses? Um, well, cancer tends to occur more commonly in patients, you know, in their sixth, seventh, and eighth decade of life. Yeah. But certainly uh, young patients can develop cancer as well. I mean, children develop cancer, which is obviously painful beyond comprehension uh, for the parents of the child when that happens. Uh, I've seen that happen in you know my own family and in friends. Mm. Uh, you know, a diagnosis of cancer in a child is, is just beyond comprehension. Yeah. So, you know, when dealing with those things, you know, it's like, wow, I, I never thought I'd have to think about something like this. Uh, and w- when young people get cancer again, it's, you know, they thought, gosh, I have my whole life ahead of me. And now I'm de- dealing with a diagnosis of mm-hmm. cancer. You got to be kidding. Mm-hmm. So it really depends on the individual. And even in older patients diagnosed with cancer, it depends on their he- overall health. Mm. There are some patients who maybe in their 60s, 70s, or 80s, who are living a highly functional life. Uh, They're living a normal life. They're enjoying things, and they're in good shape. And so they may be able to tolerate the treatments and the therapies very well. Hmm. Conversely, I've had some patients who were in their 40s or 50s and weren't healthy. They had other major health problems. They'd had heart trouble. They had diabetes. All of these are factors that make it harder for us to sometimes deliver the full cancer treatments we want to deliver because of the side effects that can Mm -hmm. occur in that individual. Mm -hmm. And so I can see if I was in my 40s, I'm like, I I have a lot more to live. Give me the treatment. Um, And, you know, it's like, well, you weren't healthy enough. You may not make, you know, that you just said, the infection, the complications, unexpected things like the heart attack. I mean, if you're not healthy, that could actually be an unexpected outcome, even though you are young. Or, right. of course, but I'm hearing on the flip side, you could be 90 or 80 and go through the surgery and you're in great health and be fine. So I guess it would be very right. hard to know what the right thing to do is. If Have you had patients that have elected to do nothing? And if so, what's What's that lifestyle and option if you decide to do nothing? I have had patients uh, elect to do nothing. Uh, you know, when we talk about, you know, look, this is what we can do. This is the potential outcomes. Um, but, you know, these are the risks. And, you know, I've had some folks say, well, let me go think it over. Let me talk it over with my family. And then they'll come back to me and say, you know, uh, I'm just going to enjoy the rest of my time. I'm going to live out what, what time I have and which time I tell them I respect that. Uh, I, you know, I obviously will be here to provide assistance or if you develop pain or other symptoms, I'll refer you to specialists who can help with that. Um, I've had some patients who, you know, have originally taken chemotherapy and on whom I performed surgery And then their cancer comes back despite that. And they say, you know, I've been through the chemotherapy. I've been through the surgery. I know what that's all about. I'm done. I've had enough of that. And Mm. I just want to live my life. Mm. And it's okay. I respect that. So, again, I always respect the autonomy of the individual Mm. and the decision they Mm. make. And, um, you know, it can cut the other way. I've had some patients who I kind of think, gosh, you know, the chemotherapy is just making you miserable and you look awful and they say, keep going, give Mm. me more, you know, Mm. try something different, try Mm. something new. And again, that's, that's also a tough decision to make. Um, Patients will sometimes accept risks that I think are excessive, but they want to try anything and everything to live as long as they can. So it it goes both ways. You know, I've Mm. seen both examples, Mm. people who, 
want to try every last thing down to the last minute. And other people who just say, eh, I've had enough. I'm just going to enjoy the few months or few years that I have left because we never know exactly how long they'll live. And yeah, that's fine. Mm. And, and for people who elect not to have the surgery, is it just dealing with the pain that then becomes the major focus of, I don't really know. I assume it's super painful to have cancer and not do anything. Well, it's pain and it may mean a change in their lifestyle or their function. Um, you know, if a patient say, for example, has a cancer that's going to require them to have an operation with a permanent colostomy is one example. Right. They may say, you know, I don't want to deal with that. That's when you cut your colon and they have to, what is a colonoscopy? A a colostomy means that the colon comes out and everything empties into a bag on their abdomen. Oh my goodness. Belly wall. Oh my goodness. So that's a major, a major change in lifestyle and life function. Uh, some people can deal with that. Some can't, mm. uh, you know, if some cancers affect the ability to eat and absorb food. Uh, you know, I've had patients who have cancer of the stomach where we tell them a surgical procedure would mean removal of your entire stomach. Wow. And so you will never again be able to eat a normal meal. So uh-huh. think about the implications of that. Wow. That's a huge thing. And, uh, Again, some people say, go for it. Sure, I I can live with that. I'll deal with it. Um, It's not dissimilar to the story you just told me of your teacher, where I've had some patients who, after they have the surgery, they said, wow, even though you told me these things and what to expect, and now that I'm actually living it, I'm not sure I would have done it again. Yeah. And so those are always hard decisions for people to make. You know, at the time, they, they obviously want to do everything they can to try to survive, to live. But um, there, I've had people say, gosh, I'm not sure I'd do it again. Mm. And then how about things um, like, uh, you know, acupuncture, Reiki, there's all these, uh, you know, and then I, I, because I've talked to a lot of the people in the spiritual realm, they'll say, I cured someone of cancer. I'm like, Really? how and i mean have you seen those kind of miracles happen and if so how would you even describe what's happening i wish i could say i had seen that i have not okay um some of those things can be important to adjuncts Mm -hmm. Uh, they can be helpful to patients and their well-being uh i'm personally a big fan of things like acupuncture and proper nutrition and diet Um, acupuncture, I have seen really help people control pain Mm -hmm. that they have related either to their cancer or to their treatment. Mm -hmm. So I never discount any of those sorts of things. I don't throw them out and say, oh no, that's unproven or that's hooey. Uh, you know, I've seen actually help patients, uh, reduce their symptoms and increase their well being. So I'm all for those sorts of things and the spiritual nature. I think that is you know, there's no way we can measure that objectively, mm-hmm. but if it helps with the patient's well-being and sense of well-being, once again, I'm all for it. Yeah, yeah, so you're pretty open-minded about it. Okay, so now, just in terms of what's happening with cancer treatments, I mean, is there any hope? Has it, I mean, you've been doing this for a while. I mean, what have you seen? Has What's the progression of cancer treatments, and uh, what hopeful things can we feel or think about uh, the curing of cancer? Well, so with some cancers, we're, we're doing much better. Um, you know, breast cancer, we're doing much better. Colon cancer, we're doing much better. Uh, some lung cancers, there are new treatments. Uh, melanoma, a type of skin cancer. Uh, there's been a huge turnaround in the last decade mm. in how well some of those patients do compared to how they did before then. Some of the newer treatments, uh, newer drugs, what we call targeted drugs or Mm. immunotherapies. Mm -hmm. They've been game changers. Mm. Um, In some cases, they may increase the rate of cure. In other cases, it may improve the lifespan of the patient. Mm. Um, Other cancers, I'm sorry to say, we haven't made much progress at all. Mm -hmm. Uh, Liver cancer, pancreas cancer, 
Uh, our, you know, the long-term probability of success is no better today than it was 40 or 50 years mm. ago. Uh, maybe living on the average longer, but in terms of actual cures, and that's usually what patients want to hear about. They want to know, right. gee, what are my chances of cured? And with many of those cancers, the answer is unfortunately not great. Mm. Um, so, you know, we need to continue to push the envelope. We need to continue to do more research. We, mm. we need to find better treatments for these diseases because, yeah, we're, things are better, but are they good enough yet? In my mind, the answer is no. Uh, is uh, melanoma, breast, colon, lung, I assume that those are, you know, the most common cancers. Is that why there are more treatments or why is it that things like liver or pancreatic, why are there fewer research and solutions than in some of these others? Is it the, the popular, I mean, the common cases of melanoma, breast, colon, and lung or why? Well, actually liver and pancreas are among the most common cancers. Yeah. Um, it's just that they, they're different in the way they behave. Mm. They're more difficult to treat. They're more resistant to treatments. Mm. Um, so, and there are, there are active research programs going on for those types of cancers. Mm. It's just that they've been more difficult to make an impact on. And some of it is the nature of those cancers. Uh, mm -hmm. They're more aggressive. They spread more rapidly. They grow more rapidly. Mm. Uh, they're harder detect at an early stage. Mm. So it's a combination of things. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the exciting areas of research that's going on now is trying to come up with new blood tests, uh, new marker studies to detect cancers earlier when we have more treatment options available to us. Mm -hmm. uh, I hear from patients all the time. They'll say to me, look, I go to my doctor every year. I get a checkup. How could I have this cancer? Well, it's because we don't have blood tests that detect the cancer. Mm. Uh, so we're now looking for things like circulating tumor cells or circulating tumor DNA. There's uh, other studies going on to try and come up with new diagnostic markers to detect cancer at an earlier stage mm. when we have more options available to us. Okay, so if I'm going to get a physical, I should be asking for hep B and C. Test. And do I just do that once or do I do that every year? Oh, no. No, just once. I mean, if, okay. if you're clear, you're clear. Okay. And then I, what else would I ask for? A colonoscopy I'm doing every five years. What else would you be asking for to, as preventative measures to detect some of these harder to cure cancers when they're detected later? Well, you know, as a woman, you should obviously be getting a mammogram yep, every that. year. Yep. Uh, you should. You should be getting checked for cervical cancer. Yeah. You know, unfortunately, another common cancer in women is ovarian cancer, mm. which is hard to diagnose because it's not something that we can easily screen for. Mm. Uh, that is one of the cancers where there are some new blood tests becoming available that we're hopeful it may help. Uh, we don't yet know that. Those are studies that are ongoing. Mm. Um, we now know that, uh, for example, there are screening trials being done in smokers, we're mm. getting CAT scans on a regular basis, may mm. diagnose the cancer at a more early stage. Clearly, For lung, it would for be, lung cancer, is that what you mean? Right. You know, it would be best if patients would stop smoking, obviously. You know, that's one of those cancers where we cause, uh, the, you know, the patients can uh, directly impact their chance of lowering their cancer risk by not smoking. You know, unfortunately, people sometimes will ask me, gee, do I ever think we're going to get rid of cancer? And I, I say... Not until we stop certain destructive behaviors like smoking and eating the improper diet and polluting our environment and doing things that are damaging to ourselves. Mm. And, and my son was trying to convince me that those jewels that are those cigarette, those things that are vape pens are not supposed to cause lung cancer. I'm like, what? Where did you read this? On the Internet. So is this a bunch of hooey? <laughs> I'm assuming it is. Uh yeah, I, I'm trusting anything that you read on the internet <laughs> is questionable behavior. <laughs> so vape pens, those are still bad for the lung. I mean, if you're doing vape pens or smoking pot, am I assuming that that makes you more likely to get lung cancer? Again, the honest answer is we don't know. People are looking at that. You know, there are studies that are being done. You know, the truthful answer is we don't know. 
you know, any of these kind of behaviors that, you know, it has the potential to have risks to one's health. Right. So you, I don't know the answer to that. Right. So if so you're I drinking think, a lot, oh, smoking, yeah. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. O- overeating, not exercising, you know, all of those. And again, you know, we, we pollute our own environment. We're kind of our own worst enemies. You know, I mean, there are stories that you've read in the news about uh, toxic chemicals that get into the water and people who live in that area have a much higher incidence of cancer, Mm -hmm. um, radioactive substances that get into water that can cause cancer. You know, all of these are terrible stories when you hear them. It's like, you know, we're, we're causing damage to our own populations by doing these things. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you so much. I've learned so much about cancer from this conversation. I hope I never have to listen to it again. (laughs) I have a strange job. I have a strange job. I tell my patients all the time, I don't wish my services on anyone, but I'm always honored. I know. I hope never to to talk to you again. All right. So here's my question. So um, your patients, I mean, because you wrote this book for, I'm assuming, to help cancer patients. In what way, and I'm sure a lot of your patients have read the books, in what ways has your book in my hands helped them? Uh, I think... Again, I've I've gotten lots of positive feedback from patients and actually other physicians and caregivers involved in cancer care, and um, you know it it gives the it tells people that they're not alone. Mm. Uh, other people have gone through this journey. Uh, it gives them a sense of connection mm. that okay, you know, I, I'm not the only person to deal with this. Other people have successfully navigated this journey. Uh, the fear I'm feeling, the concern, the anxiety, whatever, it's normal, it's okay. Uh, and there are other people who, who can support me along this path. Mm. So even though you're focused on um, pancreatic and liver cancer, if anyone has any cancer, just giving, like, so sometimes as a friend, if you have someone that has cancer, you don't really even know what to do. I mean, it's like, saying I'm sorry is ridiculous. So <laughs> I think that maybe giving them a book saying here, I know this book has helped other cancer patients just to hear their stories. Here's the book. I, I could see that as a possibility for your book. Yeah, I've had people do that. I've had people specifically say they bought my book for a friend or a family member with cancer. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, it, and again, you know, the stories in the book are truthful. I mean, not every patient, you know, this is not false hope. Right. There are patients in the stories who die from their cancer. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's the reality that we face as cancer caregivers, and it's the reality that cancer patients and their family members face. So, um, you know, I've had people say, you know, I was cheering and laughing in one chapter and then crying the next. Mm. Um and that's the way it is. Cancer yeah. is cancer. We don't win every battle. We don't cure every patient. Mm-hmm. So it's a realistic view of cancer care and what we can and can't do. Mm-hmm. But um, again, there's a commonality. There is a sense that, okay, other people have gone through this and uh, that connection can be helpful. Yeah. Thank you so much for writing this book because I know it comes from your heart. Uh, We have Dr. Stephen Curley, who is writing his book, um, In My Hands. Thank you for your time. Thank you, CJ. A pleasure. It means so much to me that you're listening to the show. I would love your support in any way by giving me comments below or to subscribe to the show or share the show with friends. Thank you again for your support. Love and blessings.